everyone, I'm Carol Hodson. Uh, you heard yesterday, I'm not medical and I'm not nursing. I don't do ECMO cannulation. I don't stand at the bedside 24 hours a day looking after our ECMO patients. I'm a physio and I'm an ICU researcher. And 13 years ago, I treated a young lady and I stood at the end of her bed after three weeks of ECMO and I wondered how she would ever recover. She was septic, she'd lost a huge amount of muscle mass and she couldn't move. And I looked at her standing there with a friend, another physio, and we said to each other, we don't think that she'll ever get back to her normal life. And she's 17, that's such a tragedy. So we all know that ECMO can save lives. It's an amazing intervention when the heart or the lungs have failed and conventional uh, life support is no longer able to sustain life, we can use ECMO. I'm asking you to proceed with caution. We have very little information about patient outcomes. We know a little about short term because we can see it when a patient survives and when they leave the intensive care unit. But we don't know much about complications and we certainly know very, very little about long-term outcomes. And this is incredibly important because the amount of ECMO that occurs has absolutely grown out of proportion. In 2008, we had about 100 ECMO centres worldwide and now in 2018, we had 400. And they are just the centres that report to the Extracorporeal Life Support Organisation. There are many centres that provide ECMO that don't report to ELSO. And we know that there are specific complications that can be related to ECMO. It produces a systemic inflammatory response in the, uh, in the body. This can lead to organ failure, it can lead to uh, sepsis. But we also know that there are specific problems from cannulation, from vascular damage, from bleeding and from thrombosis. We also know this is a very expensive care. It's not just invasive, it's expensive. And we don't really understand the costs of providing this service on our healthcare system. I'm really pleased that I've got this amazing team of people that I work with who have helped me to set up a partnership in our country to provide an ECMO uh, registry called the Excel Registry. We now plan to systematically measure patient outcomes, looking not just at survival, but actually looking at longer term outcomes. And this has really been informed by that patient that transformed my research program 13 years ago. She's helped me to look at our program of research from within our management committee and look at disability-free survival, not just survival. It's really important when you're standing at the end of the bedside and all you can see is the equipment and the noise that goes on around an ECMO patient that you actually remember that there is a person behind there. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Shanna Anderson, the young lady who 13 years ago encouraged me to take on a big rec program of research looking at functional recovery <laughs> after ECMO. Shanna, welcome. Hi. <laughs> So, Shanna has flown from Melbourne last night, stayed with her dad, Neil. Neil, thank you so much for bringing her. Shanna, you were 17 when you became really unwell. Tell me, what were you like as a 17-year-old? I would say that I was a very typical teenager. I was studying Year 12 full-time, worked part-time um, on the weekends, waitressing. I was playing centre and netball several times a week. I was in a steady relationship and also life-saving during the summer period. Yeah, so finishing her last year in school, and something happened, Shannon, what happened to you? So when I was a typical teenager, I never really got sick, but this one particular weekend, I started getting the flu, which was a surprise, and it deteriorated to the point where I presented myself to the local emergency department. I was admitted and diagnosed with pneumonia and sent home to uh, you know, recover with some painkillers. Uh, and then get some antibiotics the next day. During that night, for myself to get to sleep, I ended up taking painkiller, after painkiller, accidentally, uh, to the point where when I woke up the next day, they realised that I had probably overdosed on painkillers and presented me straight back to the hospital. That time, I remember going back to the hospital to the administration desk with blanket around my shoulders, and that's it. I don't remember anything else. To that point, I was induced um, at the local hospital, sent to another hospital, and then eventually sent to the Alfred. So this is Shanna, day one at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne. 
She was admitted with severe pneumonia. She'd been retrieved from another centre. She was intubated, sedated. She was hypoxemic. She was already on maximal ventilatory support. She was very unwell. She was septic, high white cell count. She was deteriorating rapidly. Her renal function was going off, and everybody was very concerned about her. Shanna, do you remember anything at all about the period of being intubated or being brought over to the Alfred? So I don't remember being on ECMO or going to the Alfred at all. Um, my time on ECMO is purely based on having uh, nightmares or hallucinations, is what the doctors call it. So I have two clear hallucinations that stick with me to this day. Um, the better one is um, I was stuck on this endless roller coaster, and uh, this roller coaster was, I think it must have been in the sky because there was no ground, it was all black. And the good thing was I got to eat ice cream on this roller coaster, which was very exciting. Um, the bad thing was that I couldn't get off. So I had friends and family come, sit in the carriages in front of me and behind me, chat to me for a little bit, and then they would disappear. I'd have my ice cream, and other people would come, and I just kept on going around this roller coaster. The other one was a bit more sinister. If you can imagine a small room um, with a stainless steel bench uh, in the middle. I was laying down on the stainless steel bench and I couldn't move. Um, could talk, but I couldn't move. Surrounding me was this sort of, you can imagine a comic book, eerie yellowish green glow about it. And the walls were filled with um, tanks and jars filled with like reptiles and human body parts and weird things that you would find in a science fiction novel. And suddenly, when I was lying here on that bench, the walls started to burst into flames. And uh, the entire room started to burn, and I couldn't move, I couldn't get out, no matter how much I screamed for help. Nothing was happening, and the jars would break, and things were going everywhere, and it was chaos, and it was just getting hotter and hotter. So that's my memory. <laughs> so, Shanna continued to deteriorate. By day two, she had full-blown ARDS, and she was severely hypoxemic. We had gone through a range of rescue therapies trying to um, salvage her, including all of the usual ones, neuromuscular blockers and nitric oxide and uh, some prone positioning before we started ECMO. And I think that's really important to note. Although she was put on ECMO early, there were many other rescue therapies that were tried before we put her on ECMO. By day three, Shannon was on ECMO and she actually needed dual cannulation to increase her flows because of the severe hypoxemia. And for the next four weeks, she continued on ECMO. She was incredibly productive of secretions. What I remember when I was treating her as a physio was changing her position and secretions pouring out of her. She was unconscious. She was septic the entire time. The, uh, the, the temperature was something that I had never seen or experienced for four weeks. She was burning hot, so no wonder you had such horrible nightmares about that, Shanna. Um, and I think at that period of time, Shanna doesn't remember anything except horrible nightmares, but her family, for her family, that's a completely different matter. I think the families suffer the most traumatic stress at this period of time. They have this carousel of roles that they've described to us. And part of it is that they feel that they need to be a carer, not just for the person that's in hospital, but for potentially other family members, children or parents or whoever else they have at home. They need to be a manager. They're still managing finances and legal stuff and needing signatures for things and mail and dealing with potentially employment, needing to get to a job. They have all of these roles that they're juggling while they're trying to make really life and death decisions related to their loved one. Shanna, your dad's in the audience. This is a tough one. What would your parents say about this period of time while you were sick? So I know that they would consider this the most stressful time of their entire lives. Um, being an only child and having your parents uh, sit at your bedside watching helplessly while they couldn't do anything while potentially their child could die. At one point, the doctors did say to my parents that I had a 20% chance of survival, so potentially they might need to start saying their goodbyes. Um, obviously, while they couldn't do anything and they were like, you know, praying for help that I'd pull through, mum was busy taking pictures of my journey, knowing that when I woke up, that I would want to see what had actually happened. And while mum was supporting me and being by my bedside, dad had to come back to work and provide financial assistance for both um, households so that mum could um, be there for me. 
As patients wake up, the theme that is most commonly reported to us is this sense of deconditioning and, immob and immobility. They feel like they're stuck in the bed. This is a picture of not Shanna, another patient that we've got up on a tilt table. This is a, a girl who's uh, on ECMO pre-transplant. And when, with the transplant patients, they're often awake and they're often able to participate in their rehabilitation, which is fantastic. In Shanna's case, she wasn't awake. And when she did wake up, she was, she'd lost so much muscle mass, she was really weak. Do you remember anything at all about being stuck in the bed or a sense of immobility? So when I first woke up, um, I was, as Carol said, extremely weak. I remember being so frustrated because I couldn't move my arms or legs or lift much of my body at all. Um, my elbows got a bit sore when I was trying to use them to sit up eventually. But the main thing is that I couldn't roll over in my bed. I was tied to machines both sides. And so when I did try and turn around, the machines would go flying off, the nurses would come back and put me back into this position where I just have to stay like this for days on end until I got the strength and you know, my vital signs came back. So we know that there's a rapid loss of muscle mass. That same physio that was sitting with me next to Shanna's bed 13 years ago has gone on to do a PhD looking at ECMO and recovery. Kate's recently published this paper where she's reported that there's 20% muscle mass loss by day 10 and 30% muscle mass loss by day 20. And this is Shanna at day 35. She's got a communication board, she's sitting out of bed, she's incredibly weak, she could only move her fingers. We had to place her arms for her she could hold her head up, and that was about it. Shanna, at that point in time, you're so incredibly helpless. Is there anything that we could do to improve your care? So when I was that weak and I couldn't move and I couldn't talk, it was incredibly frustrating. But the thing that made a big difference to me with the people at ICU um, is that they treated me as a person, not just as a patient. So with the um, communication board there, they put that in front of me so that eventually when I had the strength, I could communicate with them, you know, using my fingers and pointing. And even though it was a very slow, very slow process to be able to communicate, I was able to do that. So I remember one time, it was so simple, I was freezing cold and I didn't know whether it was coming from the air conditioning in the hospital, never been in a hospital before. And I was freezing, and all I wanted was a blanket or to be warm, and I just couldn't tell anybody, and it was so annoying. And I just couldn't say anything until finally they gave me the communication board, and I could just say C-O-L-D. <laughs> so we know also that there's up to 50% lower limb complications following ECMO. I've seen how amazing our doctors do cannulation but I really implore you, it's not just about speed, it's about being incredibly careful, and I know I don't need to tell you that, but some of the seromas, the nerve damage, the vascular damage stays with patients, and, and you know, we've had patients who've come back and spoken to us and said, you know, I wish I hadn't survived. The, the, the leaking from that wound is so distressing and so debilitating that I wish, I, I wish I'd died. So I think that that's something important to remember. Shannon, we've got a couple of pictures of you during rehab. This was a really important time. I think um, on day one, we had Jill Hicks say to us, the physio pushed me over, and I thought that he was teaching me how to fall, but in fact, the physio was teaching me how to get back up again. And I think that's what Brenda did for you, didn't she? She taught you how to get back up again. So can you tell us a little bit about how resilient you needed to be to work so hard at your rehab when you had been so weak? So I was really motivated when I got out of ICU to increase my rehab. I wanted to get out of hospital. I was always a fit and healthy person and I wanted to be that person again. I worked with Brenda every day, starting from just being able to get off, off the floor, stand up and walk, to be able to stretch and do cardio exercises. Um, it was that drive to get out and live my normal life being a 17-year-old girl that really kept me going. And you have some ongoing respiratory function problems, don't you? So this is you using the acapella. Um, the acapella helps with secretion clearance. So tell us a little bit, you had terrible pneumonia and that's left some lasting damage. So at the time, in that photo, I was probably about 50 to 60% function in my lungs. Today, I'm about 75, and they say that because of the lung scarring occurred from um, my pneumonia, that it's probably going to be about it. 
I have to do breathing exercises every day, um, morning and night. I have to do it before I go to work. I have to do it before I play sport. And if I'm going out you know, for a social function, I need to make sure that I do it before then because it's really embarrassing blowing into a machine and making gurgling sounds and having phlegm come up in front of people that don't really know me. <laughs> So we know that there's um, a high, very high rate of hospital readmission the following year. Shanna, can you tell us a little bit about what the following 12 months after hospital looked like for you? The 12, following 12 months was very, very hard. Not only um, I tried to go back to school, uh, but all my friends had gone, so I repeated year 12. My friends had gone off to uni and travel, and I was stuck doing my year 12. Um, I also had recurring bouts of pneumonia that ended me back up in ICU for either a day or a week, which meant I missed out on extra schooling that I needed. Eventually, once I passed school, I was able to go to uni the next year and complete my degree in archaeology. Um, so Shanna's told us that despite the fact she has some ongoing disability, she has a really good quality of life. She um, now is fit and well, she's back playing netball, she might not be able to play centre but she's a defender. Um, and I think, Shanna, that you'd agree with me when I say there's a large degree of resilience and being able to adapt to new changes and a really supportive environment that has a big role in your quality of life. Yeah, so in terms of environment, I would never be where I am today without the massive care from the hospital staff, paramedics and everything like that, but also my home care, such as my family, my friends, the rehab that I had outside, the school that um, welcomed me back to complete year 12. In terms of re resilience and adaptation, well, you know, as my dad said, you know, when I was like, why me? You know, it was so good. Um, he's like, why not? You know, what makes you so special? So, you know, you really don't... <laughs> in a loving way, of course. <laughs> you don't have a chance to just be sulky and, and end up in this wallowing self-pity pit. You really need to move forward and move on with your life and, you know, be the person that you want to be. So I'm going to wrap it up. We're a little over time. Apologies, Ganesh. Shanna, this is a really special slide and today's a very special day for you. Can you tell me about this wonderful man in the picture? So uh, this is Jared, my husband. So uh, we had our one-year anniversary when we were in hospital when I was unconscious, and today is our one-year wedding anniversary. Um, he has... <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> He has been incredibly supportive through the entire process, being with me the entire time, and you know, not just having your family there, but having someone with you your age that you can go through this with. And the handy thing, he's also now a paramedic, so you know, <laughs> it's great when things go downhill. <laughs> um, Shanna, we have to say thank you and goodbye. Mm. Shanna's actually getting on a plane right away so that she makes it home for our anniversary dinner. So a big round of applause. Thank you, Shanna, for joining yes. us. Thanks, Carol. Awesome. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.